Oh, the sutta tonight is one that I haven't done for a really long time. This is the Vachagata on, on fire. Sutta number 72. Thus have I heard on one occasion a blessed one was living at Sawati and Jetta's Grove and at Pindika's Park. Then the wanderer Vajagata went to the blessed one, exchanged greetings. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side. Excuse me, I got the hiccups for some reason. <clears throat> And he asked the Blessed One, how is it Master Gotama? Does Master Gotama hold the view? The world is eternal. Only this is true in anything else that's false. Vachagata, I do not hold that view. The world is, in, is eternal and everything else is wrong. How then does Master Gotama hold the view the world is not eternal and only this is true and anything else is wrong? Vacha, I do not hold the view the world is eternal and everything else is wrong. How is it Master Gotama? Does Master Gotama hold the view the world is finite? Only this is true and anything else is wrong. Vacha, I do not hold the view the world is finite. Only this is true and anything else is wrong. How then does Master Gotama hold the view the world is infinite? Only this is true and anything else is wrong. Vacha, I do not hold the view the world is infinite. Only this is true and anything else is wrong. How is it, Master Gotama? Does Master Gotama hold the view? The soul and the body are the same. Only this is true and anything else is wrong. This is really an, an uh, interesting observation. because that takes away the view of reincarnation. It takes the view that you are the soul. If everything is impersonal, how can there be a soul? How can be there, how can there be an everlasting thing? How can there be a continually happening thing from one lifetime to the next? So this view is a very strong indication that there is only the impersonal process and everything is changing constantly, quickly. So I'd forgotten this, and when I read it again, it just brought all of that back to me, how, how important it is to see the impersonal nature. Anything that you take personally has a hindrance behind it. Anytime you hold a view, this is me, I'm sad, I'm glad, whatever it happens to be. That means that there's a hindrance behind what you're saying. And you have a little bit of a guilty feeling with breaking that hindrance. And that's why you take it personally. So it'll come back 
So you can use that as a reminder that everything is impersonal. So the world suffer, suffers very greatly from this false belief in a personal self. And all the religions that I know of, they take the personal view and they try to justify it in one way or another. They try to make it fit their needs at the time. So this is a very strong statement. The soul and the body are the same because we take them to be the same continually. Bacha, I do not hold the view the soul and the body are the same. Only this is true and anything else is wrong. Now, the idea of holding an idea as being true and anything else is wrong is just getting caught up in more and more judging, condemning. I don't like you because your view says this and it doesn't match my view. So it's a real interesting thing to realize that 99.9% .9 of the population has this view. And that's why the world is in the mess that it's in right now. Of course, the world is always in a mess because so many people want it to be in a mess by holding on to their views, religious wars. What is it with a religious war? How can you have a religious war if it's honest? No can do. There's no such a thing. There's only hindrance wars that fight with each other. Then, how then, Master Gotama, does Master Gotama hold the view? The soul is one thing and the body another. Only this is true and anything else is wrong. That's almost comical after the explanation that I just got through. Vacha, I do not hold the view the soul is one thing and the body another. Then what goes to heaven or hell? Well, you go, your consciousness goes to heaven or hell because of your past actions, either good actions or bad. But it still has that wrong belief in it. And I know there's so much confusion about the self. And I have to uh, I have to take care of these things. I have to make myself better because of this view or that. And the more wholesome you make your mind by sitting in meditation and seeing the impersonal nature of everything, the more wholesome you, your mind becomes, the more your mind directs it to the wholesome. That's why a lot of people, when they come and practice with me, they, they leave and they say, I, I've never felt like this before. I actually feel happy. Well, yeah. Why? because you're not holding on to that wrong view of I am that, and you're not consumed by craving. The start of I am that. 
So why, why are the six R's so important? Well, they're important because of letting go of the craving that changes the entire practice. And I get, oh, I tried the 6R and I used it and I used it and I used it and it didn't work. Of course, it's not going to work immediately on everything. It depends on how strong your attachment is to what you are trying to let go of. You might have to use the 6Rs five or six times, but you don't use them one right after the other. You do the six R's and you're back to your object of meditation. You get pulled back to it. You use the six R's. You come back to your object of meditation with a happy, uplifted mind. Then that attachment gets weaker and weaker. That obsession with whatever it happens to be gets weaker and weaker until it just fades away on its own. And you didn't have anything to do with it. It works on its own. How is it, Master Gotama? Does Master Gotama hold the view after death that the Tagata exists? Only this is true and anything else is wrong. Uh, if you don't have any craving, there is no more becoming. If there's no more becoming, how can you say that you still exist after there is death? Interesting. When I was in Asia, one of the things that I was continually arguing with, but not directly, but I would argue in my own mind sometimes, people would go to a Buddha image and pray to Buddha to do something. Well, he's not here. How can he do anything? But they, they want to put their, their troubles, they want to leave it for somebody else to take care of, whether it's God or Jesus or Mohammed, Shiva, in any of those, they want to transfer that so they can have an excuse to act that way again. If there is uh, the conditions for it to be. So, no arahat is still alive after they die. There is no more craving to cause that to occur. Vacha, I do not hold the view after death of the Tathagata. After death, a Tathaga exists. Only this is true and anything else is wrong then how does Master Gautama hold the view? After death, the Tathagata does not exist. Only this is true and anything else is wrong. Now, this is a real interesting question because we hold the view that you have to exist. Well, you do exist, but it's like building a sandcastle out of sand very beautiful, wonderful looking thing, and a wave comes and knocks it down. Now, all of those grains of sand are still there. His aggregates are still there, but they're not held together with anything. Can you put that sandcastle back in exactly the same way as if it was made before? Well, anybody knows, no, not even close. So there is a consciousness that's floating around. There is perception floating around. 
there are the formations floating around, but they're not attached to anything. And this leads to the scientists now, the astronomers and astrologers and, and these kinds of folks, not astrologers, excuse me, astronomers, they say that there is energy in space. Well, of course there's energy in space. And they're now proving that even beings can be born in space. They're not very big, but there, there are occurrences where some of the aggregates get together and it forms a little being. And after a period of time, then it goes on, become bigger and until there's beings around. So there's no beginning and no end, which is something that an awful lot of people they want to know where's the be when what happened to the beginning of the of the world. There has to be a beginning. What caused the beginning? Well, what caused the beginning was a couple of these live molecules got together and started hanging out together more until there's actual beings. So it's the physics is actually starting to catch up with what the Buddha has been talking about for 2,600 years. Real interesting. Bacha, I do not hold the view after death of a Tathagata does not exist. Only this is true and anything else is wrong. Anybody that holds that idea that this is true and anything else is wrong is really suffering a lot. Look at how much uh, Christians suffer because they want Jesus to take, his, take their sins away. I can't take your sins away. You can't take mine away. They're all caused because of our past actions. And we have to take responsibility for it. This is a real important thing. And it's a thing that drew me to Buddhism because I wasn't look, looking for outside explanations of why this or why that. It made me look closely at myself first. When I first started doing meditation, I had no idea that that's what I was really doing. But over the years, it became more and more obvious that I was causing my own suffering. Uh, somebody in the family died, and I'm real sad. Who said? Well, now I don't have that person to talk to anymore. What person? You see what I'm saying? This is real important to understand that everything we do, we have to be responsible for. For the good as well as the, the unwholesome. How is it, Master Gotama? Does Master Gotama hold the view after death of a Tathagata? Both exist and does not exist. Only this is true and anything else is wrong. That is mostly your Brahmin trying to twist things around and make things confusing. 
Vajrakai did not hold the view after the death of a Tathagata, both exist and does not exist. Only this is true and anything else is wrong. Then how does Master Gotama hold the view? After death, a Tathagata neither exists nor not exist. <laughs> Well, you're going to get the same answer. It, it doesn't apply. Why look at these deep philosophical questions? And you know what I think of philosophy. Philosophy is a lot of thoughts and a lot of words without any action behind it. So you can still keep going, looking outside of yourself for the answers. And there was one thing that I read that was, it was Hindu. And let's see if I can remember it. Uh, the, the head Brahma. He was looking for a place to hide the most sacred truth that can be found. And he tried on mountaintops, he tried under the oceans, he tried in the earth, he tried in outer space, but he could, uh, people always found out those things. So finally he got wise and he said, I know where to hide it. We'll hide it inside each, each individual. They'll never think to look there. That's really true. <laughs> anyway. How is it then, Master Gotama? When Master Gotama is asked each of these 10 questions, he replies, I do not hold that view. What danger does Master Gotama see that he does not take up any of these speculative views? Pacha, the speculative view that the world is eternal, is a thicket of views, a wilderness of views, a contortion of views, a vacillation of views a fetter of views. And that's all that is. That's philosophy. It is beset by suffering, by vexation, by despair, by fever. And it does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to the cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge to awakening, to Nibbana. So that's all thinking about, and it's all reinforcing obsessions and views about everything. The speculative view that the world is not eternal, that the world is finite, it's infinite, that the soul and body are the same, that the soul is one thing and the body another, that after death a Tathagata exists, after death the Tathagata does not exist, after death Tathagata both exists and does not exist, that after death the Tathagata neither exists or does not exist is a thicket of views, a wilderness of views, a contortion, vacillation of views, a fetter of views. It is beset with suffering, fixation, by despair, by fever, and it does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge. This is another reason I like the six R's because it gives you direct knowledge. And when you have that direct knowledge of how this process actually does work in you, 
you become infinitely more intelligent. That's one of the reasons I tell people when they first come that after 10 days, you're going to be a lot smarter than when you start. And it's always true. If they follow directions and do the practice. I do not take up any of these speculative views. Then Master Gotama, does Master Gotama hold any speculative view at all? Vacha, speculative view is something that the Tathagata has put away. For the Tathagata Vacha has seen this, such as material form, such its origin, such its disappearance, such its feeling, such its origin, such its disappearance, such its perception, such its origin, such its disappearance. Such are formations, such their origin, such their disappearance. Such is consciousness, such its origin, such its disappearance. That's a big, big uh, observation about the five aggregates. Therefore, I say, with the destruction, fading away, cessation, giving up, relinquishing of all conceivings, of all excognitionations, all eye-making, mind-making, and the underlying tendency to conceit, the Tathagata is liberated through not craving and clinging. Easy to say. Takes a little while to realize it, though. When a monk's mind is liberated, thus Master Gotama, where does he reappear after death? The term reappears does not apply, Vacha. Because it's like the sand castle of sand, uh, of, uh, yeah, sand. Then he does not reappear. This term does not reappear, does not apply, Vacha. Because the sand is still there. It just can't be put together in exactly the same way. Then he both reappears and does not reappear, Master Gotama. The term both reappears and does not reappear does not apply. Then he neither reappears nor does not reappear. Master Gotama, the term neither appears nor does not reappear, does not apply. When Master Gotama is asked these four questions, he replies, the term reappears does not apply. The term does not reappear, does not apply. The term both reappears and does not reappear, does not apply. The term neither appears nor does not reappear does not apply. Here I have failed and I have fallen into bewilderment. Here I have fallen into confusion and the measure of confidence I had gained through previous conversations with Master Gotama has disappeared. It is enough to cause you bewilderment, Vacha, enough to cause you confusion. For this Dhamma is profound, hard to see, hard to understand, peaceful, sublime, unattainable by mere reason, by mere reasoning, subtle to be experienced by the wise. 
that was just another uh, interpretation of the good qualities of the Dhamma. And the only way you can interpret these things to be experienced by the wise is by seeing how this process of dependent origination and its impersonal nature occur. You don't have any control over it. These things happen by themselves. But I'm here. Are you? Or is that just a way of talking? It's when you drop the belief that everything is yours personally. When you six are and let go of all this unwholesome nature of craving in all its manifest forms, it's when you let those go that you truly do become wise because you see life is part of a process and it's impersonal. It's conditioned. One, one uh, link arises, fades away. The next re or link arises, fades, fades away. And it happens really fast. So it's, it's not something that's easy to see. And the only way you're able to see it is when you slow down and let go of that false belief in a personal self. Uh, there was a movie that was called Lucy. And she gave an example of a car going along a road. And the car sped up and sped up and sped up until it wasn't there anymore. What's the truth of it? Oh, it was still there. But you weren't able to discern it. You weren't able to see it. So when you start letting go of craving, and you really do let go of the craving. Your awareness of how these links becomes clearer and clearer. And you'll see this process and it seems like it slows down, but actually your awareness is becoming more used to seeing with a clear mind. Now, all of this nonsense about dependent origination being so difficult to understand, it's only difficult to understand if it's a philosophy. But when you start seeing it personally, and you start being able to discern each one of these links, even though they are happening very fast. It's not a philosophy anymore. It's just a process. So. It's hard for you to understand when you hold another view accept another teaching, approve of another teaching, persuade a different training, and follow a different teacher. So I question you about this in return, Vacha. Answer as you choose. What do you think, Vacha? Suppose a fire were burning before you. Would you know? This fire is burning before me. I would, Master Gotama. If someone were to ask you, Vacha, what does this fire burning before you? 
burn independence on. Being asked, what would you answer? Being asked, Master Gotama, I would answer, the fire is burning before me and it burns independence on the grass and sticks. If that fire before you were to be extinguished, would you know this fire before me it had been extinguished? I would, Master Gotama. If someone were to ask you, Vacha, when that fire before you was extinguished, to which direction did it go? Did it go to the east, the west, the north, or south? Being asked thus, what would you answer? That does not apply, Master Gotama. The fire burned independence on its fuel and grass and sticks. When that fire is used up, if it does not get any more fuel, being without fire, it is reckoned to be extinguished. Reasonable, I suppose. So too, Vacha, the Tathagata has abandoned all material form by which one describing the Tathagata might describe him. He has cut it off at the root made it like a palm stump, done away with it so that there is no longer any subject to future arising. The Tathagata is liberated from reckoning in terms of material form. Vacha, he is profound, immeasurable, hard to fathom, like the ocean. The term reappears does not apply. The term does not, does not reappear does not apply. The term both reappears and does not reappear does not apply. The term neither reappears nor does not reappear does not apply. The Tathagata has abandoned that feeling by which all describing the Tathagata might be just might describe him. So you're getting an idea of why I like this sutta because it is exclusively talking about the impersonal nature of everything. Uh, and, and has abandoned that perception by which unwholesome, what, what is unwholesome, right view is wholesome. And these 10 things are unwholesome and the other 10 things are wholesome. When a monk has abandoned craving, cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump, done away with it so that it is no longer subject to future arising, then that monk is an arahat with taints destroyed, one who has lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached the true goal, destroyed the fetters of being and is completely liberated through final knowledge. Apart from Master Gotama, is there any one monk, Master Gotama's disciple, who by realizing for himself with direct knowledge here and now enters upon and abides in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom, that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. There are not only 100 vacha, or two, or three, or four, or 500, but far more monks, my disciples, who by realizing for themselves with direct knowledge here and now enter upon and abide in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. Apart from Master Gotama and the monks, is there any one bhikkhuni, 
Master, Master Gautama's disciple, who by realizing for herself with direct knowledge here and now enters upon and abides in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the taints, the uh, destruction of the taints. There are not only a hundred or five hundred, but far more bhikkhunis, my disciples, who by realizing for themselves with direct knowledge here and now, abide in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. Apart from Master Gotama and the monks and the bhikkhunis, is there any one man lay follower, Master Gotama's disciple, clothed in white, leading a life of celibacy, who with the destruction of the five lower fetters will appear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. There are not only a hundred or five hundred, but far more lay followers, my disciples clothed in white, leading lives of celibacy with the destruction of the five lower fetters will reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and their final Nibbana with, with, uh, will attain final Nibbana without any returning from that world. Now this is something interesting that I ran across in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Asia, and, and mostly, that people were very much afraid of becoming an anagami because they have this idea that because they won't have any sexual desire that they won't live a good family life. They're so attached to the idea of having sexual activity, they're afraid to let it go. They don't see the true advantages of being celibate, of not having that, that worry, that anxiety come up it's real amazing to me that they would stop their, their spiritual growth because of fear of not having sexual activity. There's a lot of coarseness in sexual activity. You can still live with your family. Imagine growing up with a family they, both the mother and father are anagami and they're raising a child without any hatred, without any pride, without any unwholesome things. Now the child is still going to get into problems. They're still going to get into questioning and not liking and hating and all of these kind of things. But by and large, children mimic their parents. How their parents handle a problem, that's how they wind up handling a problem. So a little child wants to stick a, a piece of metal in an electric socket, you don't want them to do that. You have to stop them and explain why they shouldn't do that. That it will cause them a lot of pain that could even cause them death. And they will have the tendency to listen to that. So, a family that has anagamis for parents, 
they wind up having more and more harmonious reactions with each other. And as a result, they don't suffer near as much. So I've, I've always found this to be quite interesting. Now, I've been told by some teachers in Germany, Dhamma teachers, that there's no way you can attain Nibbana unless you become an Arahat. That's the only way you can, you can get to that lofty goal. And I said, no, that's not true. And they said, well, show me in the suttas where it says that. Well, this particular sutta shows it out very, very clearly. And they still wouldn't accept it. So, okay, you go on your way, I'll go on mine. I don't need to talk with you anymore. So it's a real interesting thing, the views that people hold and the fears and anxieties they hold on to because they're afraid of being too wholesome. That, to me, that just doesn't make sense. So, apart from Master Gotama, the bhikkhunis and bhikkhus, the men followers dressed in white, both those leading lives of celibacy and those enjoying sensual pleasures, is there any one woman lay follower? Well, of course the answer is yes. See, something that really it is confusing to a lot of people is that when you're talking about the spiritual path, there is no difference between men and women. It's just that men have dominated for so long. They, they say, well, if you're a woman, you, you can't even understand this. I had a female follower and we went to a big conference and she got a hold of one of the very big monks of Thailand. And she started telling him about what she knew of dependent origination. Now she had had a direct experience and understanding of dependent origination. And what she was telling him was right, but I wasn't with them at the time. I'd been talking to somebody else and I looked over and I saw that she kind of had this monk cornered. So I thought, oh boy, this is going to be fun. So I went over and as soon as he saw me, he ignored the, the person that was talking to him, the female, and got in my face, and he said, how dare you teach the higher teaching to women? And I said, why do you say that? And he was just beyond himself. He was just really angry. You can't teach these women, they don't understand. Why did you do that? And I said, because she could understand. And he got so flustered that he walked off. Oh, well. And he looks like she's asleep. Okay. 
apart from uh, Master Gotama, the bhikkhunis, bhikkhus, the lay followers dressed in white, both those leading uh, lives of celibacy and those enjoying sensual pleasures, and the women lay follower dressed in, in white. Who carries out his instructions, responds to his advice, and has gone beyond doubt, become free from perplexity, free from intrepidity, and become independent of others in the teacher's dispensation. There are not only a hundred or five hundred, but far more women lay followers men lay followers, bhikkhunis and bhikkhus. Master Gotama, if only Master Gotama were accomplished in this Dhamma, but no bhikkhus were accomplished, and this holy life would be deficient in that respect. But because Master Gotama and the monks are accomplished in this Dhamma, this holy life is thus complete in that respect. If only Master Gotama and monks were accomplished in this Dhamma, but no bikini, bikunis were accomplished then this holy life would be deficient in that respect. If only Master Gotama, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis were accomplished in this, but no men followers clothed in white leaning to the celibacy were accomplished, then this holy life would be deficient in that respect. But because Master Gotama's monks and bhikkhunis and lay followers dressed in white and women followers dressed in white and lay followers, uh, men and women were dressed in white. Then this holy life would be deficient in that respect but because Master Gotama, monks and bhikkhunis, men and women lay followers, I'm cutting out some of this because it's just repetition. Then uh, this, this path would be deficient. So how many times have I, I've been told by monks, heard monks giving talks that to attain Nibbana, it's impossible in this lifetime. If you're really good for the next hundred lifetimes, you might be able to attain Nibbana. Now, what does that say? That says that what's being taught is deficient. It's missing something. And what is it missing? It's missing the six R's. It's missing right effort. It's missing letting go of and relaxing away of craving. So an awful lot of the Dhamma talks you hear are deficient. They might be good, they might be entertaining, you might learn something from them, but if they don't continually remind you to let go of the craving and can explain what craving is and how to let it go, and how to recognize it when it first starts, if they don't put that in their Dhamma talks, then it's all philosophy and it's deficient according to the Buddha's teaching. 
just as the river Gange include, inclines towards the sea, slopes towards the sea, flows towards the sea, and extends all the way to the sea, so too Master Gotama's assembly with its homeless ones and its householder inclines towards Nibbana. Oh, see, there is hope. Slopes towards Nibbana, flows towards Nibbana, and extends to all the way to Nibbana. Magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what was overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. Uh, uh, some people have this idea that you do good action, but you don't share that merit of the good action with other people. And the Buddha said that that's not the way to do things. You should always be sharing your merit with other beings. And he gave this example that there's a village that didn't have any fire. They didn't, none of the houses had light. And this one man came visiting and he had a candle. And he went to each one of the householders and gave them light for their house. Did he lose anything from doing that? Did that fire change much? So you share your merit. Every good action that you do. Now, when I was working in a nursing home and I was being with people that were dying, one of the last things that I did to help their mind be uplifted was I would tell them that every good action that I have ever done in any lifetime I share that merit with them. Quite often, their mind would become very happy. And their rebirth was in a Devaloka, in a very nice place. And that was really satisfying to me to know that I could help someone and then share the merit of that with somebody else. So sharing your merit with everybody you see is a great thing to do. It's not just a good thing. This is how you practice your generosity. This is how you help the world to lessen their suffering. So, then he said, I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Danga and Sangha, mon uh, Sangha of monks. I would receive the going forth under Master Gotama. He's asking to be ordained. I would see, receive the full admission. Vachika, one who formerly belonged to another sect and desires to go forth and have the full admission in this Dhamma and discipline, lives on probation for four months. At the end of four months, if the monks are satisfied with him, they give him the going forth in a full ad admission to the monks. But I recognize individual differences in this matter. Venerable sir, if those who formerly belong to another sect and desire the going forth in full admission in this Dhamma and discipline, 
live on probation for four months. And at the end of that, the monks were satisfied with their going forth. Then I will live on probation for four years. At the end of four years, if the monks are satisfied with me, let them give me the going forth and full admission to the monk's state. Then the wanderer Vachagata received the going forth under the blessed one and received full admission. Not long after his full admission, a half a month after his admission, the venerable Vachagata went to the blessed one. Now, this is only two weeks. After paying homage to him, he sat down on one side and told the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, I have attained whatever can be attained by knowledge of, the, the, uh, of a disciple in higher training. Higher training here means meditation. By true knowledge of a disciple in higher training, let the Blessed One teach me the Dhamma further. In that case, Vachika, develop further two things, serenity and insight. What is serenity? It's letting go of craving so that your mind has no excitement in it. So your mind can be peaceful and calm. And insight is always seeing how the links of dependent origination work. When these things are developed, they will lead to the penetration of many elements. To the extent that you may wish, may I will the various kinds of supernormal power having been one, may I become many? I always thought that would be useful. That way I could be teaching here and in Asia at the same time. Having been many, may I become one. May I go unhindered through walls, through an enclosure, through a mountain, as though through space. May I dive in and out of the earth as though it were water. May I walk on the water without sinking. Now these are uh, powers that you can develop I won't tell you how because you have to spend the time with me and it takes about 10 years to do it. So I'm not interested in teaching that too much. Why does it take so long? Because of the pride of being able to accomplish this. I, I met a monk that was very adept at flying in the air but he was not uh, cautious with doing it. And uh, a bunch of lay people, this was in Burma, they saw him flying in the air and all of a sudden he was an arahat to them. And they were a very poor village, but they, they gave everything they possibly could to him. Anyway, I talked with him for a while and he kept saying, I don't know why these people keep saying that I can do this, that I'm an arahat. He said, well, stop showing off. Stop, walk wherever you want to go. Don't fly. But he, he was attached to it. And he was very, very worried that he was, he was breaking any rules of the monks. 
every new moon and full moon, I would sit down with the Sangha and we would recite the all of the uh, all, all of the verses. It's called the Padimoka. All of all of the sutta, the not suttas, um, all of the rules of discipline, of which there's two hundred and twenty-seven, and they're recited in Pali. So it generally takes because they in Burma they're real big on doing something so well that they can do it fast. It only took about a half an hour to go through all of the the different rules. And then we would sit around and discuss what what if this rule was broken? What can you look forward to having happen, happening to you? And how can you understand it more deeply? And with him, he would catch me and on both the new moon and full moon and go over the same questions over and over again, hearing that he had broken one of the rules. And eventually he disrobed because he said, it's just too much pressure to keep all these rules. He wasn't understanding the depth of what the teaching was. And I couldn't help him any more than I already did because I was a young monk at the time. I was only, oh, I, I must have been oh, eight range retreats, eight, eight years a monk. So I wasn't even an elder at that time. You don't get to be an elder monk until you're in the Sangha for 10 years. And now I've, I've got the title that I don't use of Maha because I've been a, a monk for more than 20 years. Anyway, he was very adept at using the air element so he could float around. And you, you could see him. You know, he'd, he'd be 100, 200 feet in the air, flying from one place to another. Uh, there are stories in Sri Lanka that there were so many monks that were good at that. They were flying everywhere and they blocked the sun so the crops couldn't grow, so they couldn't feed the monks. <laughs> I'm not sure I believe something like that, but it makes for a good story. Anyway, uh, walking on water, all they do is in their mind, they produce earth. And then it's like they're walking on earth when they're walking in the water. And there's, there's other things that, that I'm not going to talk about that you can do. You can become many. And if you're, you're many, that means that you can also clean up the monastery in a short period of time because there might be, you might make a hundred of you that's cleaning and washing and doing all the things that need to be done. So. May I will bodily mastery even as far as the Brahma worlds. And that means that they can, you can go and visit these different realms. And it's always interesting to do that. And, and talk with them. That's developing the divine eye and the divine ear. I have some students that are very good with that sort of thing. But that is because of their own abilities and how sensitive they are to feeling. Usila Nanda was one of the most brilliant men I've ever met. 
but he was not very sensitive to feeling. It didn't mean he didn't feel, but he wasn't very sensitive to it. And I, I used to tell him that he was very much like Sariputta, who is not sensitive to feeling. And there's, there's a story about him. Uh, Sariputta was sitting in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness for a period of time. And there were a couple of devas that came around and they saw him sitting there. And one of the devas said, I'm going to smack him in the head. And the other deva said, nah, not this monk, don't, don't be doing that. And it said that he hit Sariputta so hard that it would drop an elephant, which is a pretty good smack. And Mogalana happened to be walking by and he saw this, this being slap Sariputta. And right after that, Sariputta came out of the meditation and Mogalana said, did you feel that? And he said, well, Sariputta said, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, a, a, a being came down and smacked you in the head really, really hard. And Sariputta said, well, I do have this slight pain right here. It's not, not anything to worry about. Right after that being slapped Sariputta, he was reborn into a, a hell realm. So don't mess around with our odds. Be nice to them. Anyway, a lot of people, if they do develop these abilities, I very much caution them on using them in front of laymen because all of a sudden they're turned into something really special and they can do these kind of things, but they don't listen to the Dhamma. So it's a distraction and a dis disservice. I have a lot of students that say, well, I wish I could read somebody else's mind. And that has always confused me. Why would I want to read somebody else's mind? I got enough nonsense in my own mind. I don't need to listen to theirs too. What difference does it make? But there is that, set, that situation. So I try to talk people out of it as much as I can. So this sutta, it turns out to be quite long and goes into all of the different things like a divine ear and divine eye. And the divine ear means that if you put your attention on wanting to see me in person, no matter where I am in the world, you'll be able to see me. And if you, if you want to hear what I'm saying, you'll be able to hear what I'm saying. So that should be caution enough for everybody to use good speech, don't use bad speech. But also, you can go and visit beings in other realms. You can go to the the hungry ghost realm, you can go to the hell realms, you can go to the, all of these different realms, you can go to heavenly realms, you can go visit the uh, realms where there's only anagamis and arahats and talk to them and see what they have to say. You can do that sort of thing, but that is because of your sensitivity and you're naturally being able to do that. 
it happens pretty spontaneously. And I've had some students that I don't believe this stuff is real. And I asked them, well, did you plan on this happening? No, it just happened. Well, I wouldn't doubt it then anymore. I think you're, you're developing the divine eye and divine ear. And that's good. Okay, so I'm going to stop reading this very lengthy suit. There's still a lot more in it. Because I've been talking for an hour and 20 minutes as it is. So what I'm going to do is ask you, please, do you have any questions? Always the silence. Oh, there you go. Where? Uh, you're uh, muted there. Yes, Bonte. Uh, yes. Um, lots of talks, including today, on dependent origination. Um, I'm thinking that if I'm getting this right, the way to really understand dependent origination is. Spend time in meditation and six R. It's not a, it's not a like a cognitive thing. Is that right? right. That's it. The only way you can really know dependent origination is by seeing it for yourself. Anybody else have a question? Yes, Bonte. Yeah. Um, so at the beginning of the sutta, uh, they kept on asking uh, Buddha um, all the different uh, aspects and you know speculations. Yeah. And it seemed like you know they were they wanted you know the philosophy. They wanted some sort of concrete thing that were to happen. Right. right? And and that was being avoided because of the uh, impersonal nature of everything. Um. And that was the focus, it seemed like, on, on showing that everything changes, everything's impersonal, nothing stays the same, and there's a lot of karma uh, that um, conditions it. And I've heard um, this term, uh, conditioned reality. Right. What is it conditioned by? By what happened right before it. <laughs> okay. that's, that's the nature of dependent origination. That's why they call it dependent origination, because it depends on the, the link right before it. If that link doesn't come up, then what happens afterwards will not occur. Uh, so now the, uh, the individual who may get to the point where uh, is not craving right. breaks the link. Well, every link has some craving in it, or it wouldn't arise. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get to the unconditioned, when mm. there's no more conditions for the arising of these links of dependent origination, they're not going to arise. I see. It Thank sounds you. tricky, but it's not really. <laughs> and I've, I've always, uh, for, for many years, I've understood the links of dependent origination, not from direct practice, but by just going over it over and over and over again and understanding as best I could. 
And when you're able to see this as process, it's like you're waking up from a dream. And you become completely alert. It's like you lay down for a short nap and you wake up and everything, the colors are more brighter and everything is, sounds are, are more uh, clear. That's what happens when you start seeing how dependent origination actually works. And the idea that it's really hard to understand this is confounding to me. I don't know why so many uh, teachers, well, I do know why, because they're taking it from the Visuddhi Magga that says that if you, un if you try to understand dependent origination, it's the weight of all the oceans of the world on your head. And that's just nonsense. It's so practical. It, it, it makes so much sense when you start seeing how this process actually does work and see it and, and its impersonal nature. It arises because something else arose to make that come up. Well, why don't all the actions of everything you've done in the past come up right now? Well, that's the way karma works. When conditions are right, it's going to arise. If the conditions aren't there, it's not going to arise. And the more you purify your mind, the less likely you are to have hindrances come up. Unmute, Andy. Oh, um, so there, I understand there's a difference between dependent origination and condition, conditionality. Can you elaborate on that a minute? Well, what do you understand it to be? Because to me, it's the same thing. It is conditioned. Well, that's what I thought. But for some reason, I have heard that there, there's a difference between conditionality because conditionality seems kind of obvious in so many ways a farmer would know that right you know you have to have good conditions for the farm to happen right and but but i was given the uh, impression that that was too simplistic an idea no it's not that's why it gets so confusing because so many other teachers are going to tell you over and over again that you're not going to understand this. So why even try? But it, it's simple. Because of this, that occurs. If this doesn't arise, then that's not going to arise. So it, it's, to me, it's easy. And I don't know why so many teachers don't like that idea. You're on the right path. I see that. Any other question? Uh, I have a question, Bonte. Okay. Um, <laughs> The Buddha himself, when Ananda came to him and said, uh, this dependent origination, it's, it's really very straightforward. It's really very simple. I can yeah. see it very clearly. The Buddha said, say not so, Ananda, say not so. Yeah, and, this uh, dependent let, let origination me, is very me, deep. Let me explain this. Please. Ananda had been a Sotapanna for a long time. He was talking to the Buddha right after he got his fruition, and he really understood it. That's why he said that. Now, the <laughs> Buddha said, this is hard to understand. It's hard to come up with and understand it. That's what the Buddha is talking about. 
because he was the first one of our era to really understand how dependent origination worked. It's hard to come up with that. <clears throat> he wasn't talking generally about it being hard. And that's one of the misunderstandings of that sutta, which I like very much. <clears throat> Wonderful. Well, thank you, Bhante. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> Anybody else? Monte, one more question, if I could, please. Yes, please. Uh, I notice that the more I sit, the more I am able to recognize things in my day-to-day -day life. For example, someone says something that makes me angry before the recording starts, and I go and go and go. My mindfulness catches it. I can six R it. No. Well, the other day, this is my question. The other day I was driving to work and a song came on that I liked that stuck in my head. And during the day, it was in, the, in my head all day long. And I kind of recognize it as the same type of recording. Is that type of thing to be 6 r as yeah. well as anger and frustration? Yeah, because you're taking it personally. That's why it stays there, because you like it. So it's two sides of the same coin, the anger, the frustration, as well as grasping and clinging to right. things yeah, that you think. enjoy. Is that correct? Yeah. So you treat it's treated the same way. Exactly. Very good, Monte. Thank that's, you very that's much. That's what makes this whole process simple. But we like to make it complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Thank you very much, Monte. Okay. Anybody else? I hope you enjoyed the sutta as much as I enjoyed giving it to you. So let's share some merit. May suffering one be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I hope you all have a wonderful week and I'll see you next Sunday. Thank, Thank you. you Bande. Thank you very much, Bhante. Yeah, thank you so much. It's really great.